Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear representatives of Polish and Slovenian companies and institutions, distinguished guests, warm welcome here to the Slovenian Polish Business Forum with focus on digitalization and cybersecurity. We are all very much excited to host you here at Slovenian Digital Center, which was established by the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology of the Republic of Slovenia in association with public agency Spirit Slovenia, Slovenian Digital Innovation Hub, and the company BTC. Slovenian Digital Center is a hotspot for promotion of innovative ideas and solutions during Slovenian presidency to European Union. It was designed with the objective to create a networking space where companies, institutions, visitors, students could exchange ideas, promote solutions, and talk about future trends, but not only in the field of digitalization, but in a little bit broader aspect of all green, creative, and smart technologies. Nevertheless, we will try to focus today's event to digitalization or digital transformation and cybersecurity. The digitalization of society and economy through the innovative and intensive use of ICT offers many opportunities for growth and is a basis for long-term development and competitiveness of Slovenia, Poland, and Europe as a whole. For this purpose, a public agency, Spirit Slovenia, together with the Polish Agency for Investment and Trade, the Triglau Risi Business Club, and the Embassy of the Republic of Poland are organizing today's event. We will have two short presentations of Slovenian and Polish business environments. We will have two very interesting expert panel discussions, following by B2B meetings and networking between Slovenian and Polish companies. We are all sure that you will find just the right partners, the right ideas for your new and exciting projects. Once again, warm welcome to everyone, and a special welcome goes to His Excellency Dr. Krzysztof Jan Olinski, Ambassador of the Republic of Poland to Slovenia, and of course to the whole Polish delegation. I've been told that Mr. Ambassador will join us shortly, and in between, I would like to w welcome you also on my behalf. I am Marko Govek, and I will be your host today. And to kick off this event, I would like to invite Dr. Tomasz Kustaniewicz, the director of Spirit Slovenia, for a short welcome speech. Thank you for introductory words. Luckily, I can be without mask when I speak, so I will be as long as possible. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, dear guests, thank you for coming to Slovenia. I have been in my first visit to Poland 15 years ago uh, when I was making my first PhD. Uh, and last time, when I have been in forum in Karpac, it was great. It was great. I'm impressed. So I hope that we will find today some special addition possibility of our cooperation to making new uh, opportunities for both firms from Slovenia and also from Poland and uh, for partnership on our governmental level because I have heard today that we have so many possibilities also to find out something new from your perspective, for your point of view, from your good practice. And I hope that we will show also our good practices. And um, as far as I know, we will connect all the possibilities that you will try to get it in uh, Slovenia. And I hope that you will also give us a path to Polish uh, firms for Slovenian who want to invest there and um, to have uh, some additional um, um, opportunities. Um, 
I, I would also like to thank to our uh, Slovenian Polish club, to the Mr. Hojnik, who is in charge for all the things, and it is our um, salary from uh, our agency, Spirit Slovenia. And I will say a few words about uh, our agency. We have four major topics that we are carrying off, and these are internationalization for the firms that want to invest in uh, foreign lands, for foreign direct investment. Those are for those who want to invest in Slovenia. And we have also incentives, quite a lot of them, around 80 million per year. But anyhow, we are still uh, working on the field of, uh, this is uh, the last part of it on the entrepreneur level, just to establish this uh, ecosystem of innovation. So uh, as I have already speak with you today, I see there, there is also one opportunity that we can set new path for our startups, scale-ups, and uh, we see the possibility how to work on that field. So anyhow, this uh, digitalization and what we will speak today about, it is on that field uh, quite new. And uh, I think that both sides, we have impressions and uh, great results also in past, and I hope the future one will be even greater. I have to invite you to our Slovenian pavilion in Expo. I think that we already met. I have been in Yomper Pavilion in Dubai, so it's quite nice. Uh, and I hope this is even uh, one additional possibility to, to connect us, because we are from Slovenia or from Europe and you are from Poland, and we can be together as one single European nation. So I hope that you will have today a fruitful meeting and uh, you will find some additional contacts and I hope uh, also further on some businesses. So this is from my side. Um, I don't know, I'll be just standing here without a mask <laughs> because uh, the winner of election will be that guy who will set us off from the mask. I think so. <laughs> so thank you very much once again and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tomasz Kustanewicz, for your kind words. I'm emphasizing today that today's event was co-organized by our Polish partners, so we were very much looking forward to give floor also to Mr. Krzysztof Drinda, the chairman of the Polish Investment and Trade Agency. But unfortunately, Mr. Drinda could not join us today, but he was so kind to prepare a short video announcement instead. So let's... I suggest that we we'll take a look and listen to Mr. Drinda from Poland. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Slovenian Polish Business Forum on Digitization and Cybersecurity. First of all, let me thank our partners from Spirit Slovenia, led by Dr. Tomasz Kostaniewicz. His Excellency Krzysztof Olenski, the Ambassador of the Republic of Poland to the Republic of Slovenia, as well as the Polish-Slovenian Business Club Trigla Frisi for organizing and supporting this important event. I would especially like warmly welcome the representatives of Slovenian and Polish companies, institutions and government administrations who are active in the field of digitization and cybersecurity and above all Mr. Bostian Korytnik, Minister of Public Administration and Mr. Janusz Cieszyński, Secretary of State and Government Plenipotentiary for Cybersecurity. Bearing in mind the importance of digital transformation with particular emphasis on cyberspace security I am deeply convinced that this event will help us summarize the current situation and find new solutions for further close cooperation of Slovenian and Polish IT companies. The integrators of digital solutions as well as economic self-government, business support institutions and Slovenian and Polish diplomatic missions. I hope that during the B2B talks and discussions accompanying the forum, several important issues will be raised, such as 
challenges in the implementation of more and more advanced digital tool in the daily operations of companies, but also in the public civic area. The sharing of experience and best practices in the field of cybersecurity and digitization prioritize in the field of cybersecurity and digitization in the future. Major changes to be implemented in the next few years. New EU directives impacting on Slovenian and Polish strategies in relation to those areas. I wish the event every success and all guests and the participants very rewarding networking meetings. We all look forward to strengthening the foundations for future growth in the area of digital transformation in the new post-pandemic environment. Thank you for your attention. And big thank you also to Mr. Drinda to uh, Poland. Yes, the present of His Excellency Dr. Krzysztof Jan Olinski, the Ambassador of Republic of Poland in Slovenia, gives this event a special significance because political and government support to innovative businesses is of extreme importance. And as we know, the diplomacy can, can open many doors. But diplomacy also does not, um, does not take into the considerations uh, the, 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 the agenda. And Mr. Ambassador is uh, joining us shortly. Please so. give an applause for Dr. Krzysztof Jan Olenski. Hello, welcome here. Please give us a few words of uh, introduction and uh, welcome to, to kick off this meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Krzysztof Olenski, Polish ambassador here in, in, in Slovenia. Uh, ambassadors, they are having a lot of uh, different uh, um, virtues. Uh, we are having a lot of power, we are having a lot of instruments to exercise uh, uh, the foreign policy, to, to create bridges between nations, uh, to, to help uh, our citizens uh, uh, to, to reach the goals in the, in the foreign states, to, to help uh, the host state to be, uh, to be uh, much more friendly to, to, our, to, to our nation. But there is uh, one element that we are absolutely unable to, to exercise. Uh, we have really, we, 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 we don't have uh, any possibility uh, for uh, by location. Uh, just five minutes, uh, or three minutes uh, ago, uh, I was participating in a, in a, in a, in a conference on the origin of uh, constitution in Poland and in Slovenia. And uh, just talking about uh, this, this issue, uh, I, I realized uh, that we are having much more in common than we can imagine. On, on, different, on different levels, uh, economy, business, it's probably the, the strongest. Because in spite of the fact that we were uh, quite distant uh, in the way of the, of the geography, since uh, the 8th century, we were absolutely very close and we were taking many contacts. Probably very few of you uh, are uh, aware of the fact that Krakow was established uh, by Slovenian, Prince Krak, who came from here, from, from Karantania. And if you will look around uh, Ljubljana, uh, the, the, the nice monuments of the dragons, uh, will be watching on you from every corner. It's the same dragon that you are going to meet in Krakow. So uh, then walking around uh, Ljubljana, you will also uh, happen on uh, the small place uh, in a small portier called Krakowo. 
it, it's not the, the incident. It's a coincidence. It's a very strong coincidence. Then for centuries, uh, the commerce from north to south and to, from south to, uh, to, to the north uh, was the essence of the Central Europe. This access going from uh, Gdańsk to, to Koper uh, was not artificial. It was the real. It, it, it was the real access of the European economy. It was only in the beginning of the 18th century that it, this axis was changed from the west to the east. So today, when we are talking about uh, business uh, exchange, about uh, doing business between Slovenia and, and Poland, we are not discovering something new. We are coming back on the old tracks, not only in a bilateral ways, but also in frames of the EU, also in frames of the Three Sister Initiative. And for today, the, the most important element of those relations is the e-commerce, there are new technologies, there are infrastructure for uh, the, the cyber economy. So I really do hope that for, for next hours, for next days, you will have uh, enough time uh, to uh, discuss together and to find new opportunities in developing cooperation uh, in this, in this uh, the digital uh, the economy uh, sphere. I would like to uh, extend my gratitude uh, to uh, Spirit Slovenia, first of all to Dr. Tomasz Kostanec, uh, with whom uh, we started to chat about this meeting uh, some three months ago. So it means that uh, in spite of the COVID, in spite of the different obstacles, we were able just to uh, make this uh, meeting happen. Uh, due to the uh, excellent cooperation and the, uh, and the and the excellent work of uh, Andrea uh, Mulets Bohitz, uh, who, who who was uh, I mean the kind of the uh, kind of the uh, uh, I mean, locomotive of this project, uh, and of course Matej Hojnik, uh, president of uh, the Polish Slovenian business. Uh, club, Recep uh, Triglav. And I, I would like also to uh, extend my gratitude uh, to uh, two wonderful ladies from my embassy, uh, Madame Bogumiła Partey uh, and Madame uh, Monika Langiewicz. Last but not least, it's maybe a little bit less protocular. But anyway, it's, it's very important. I would like to, uh, to thank you, Mr. Minister, for coming for this, uh, for this forum. Uh, Mr. Minister uh, Krzysztof Schubert, uh, he's one of the most re remarkable person in this entire infrastructure of the Polish digital economy. So having you here, Mr. Minister, uh, it's a, a very important and visible sign that Polish-Slovenian uh, cooperation on the, on the field of the digital uh, economy will be going uh, very fast uh, ahead and very soon we will receive some important uh, outcomes uh, of it. I am personally very interested because business is creating money. Money are bringing taxes and administration is paid by the taxes, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you also uh, for putting this event, which is itself looking towards the future, also in the historic perspective of our cooperations between our nations. And as you said, 
the economic cooperation and exchange between Poland and Slovenia is steadily and consistently growing. But there are still some potentials to be discovered and harnessed. Slovenia is an excellent business and investment location and a land of great potentials for your businesses. Why, you might ask? Because doing business requires trust. And the trust is built on Slovenia's green qualities, creative talent and smart solutions. Let's find out more in this short video. Those who trust us appreciate our great geostrategic location. In the last two decades, we've also proven ourselves as a trustworthy business partner. Technologically advanced, sustainable and innovative products helped us boost that trust and made us one of the fastest growing CEE countries. as well as a valued member of leading international associations. Trust in cutting edge, sustainable and innovative products established our companies as global leaders in niche markets. We've become an important R&D player in the region. Because we know that innovative business needs innovative people. Who have a talent for creating value. Our open, stable and competitive FDI environment. Recognized by many global companies. Starting a business is fast and simple. Apart from pro-business climate, Slovenia is a perfect environment to work and live in. Slovenia, a land of infinite potential for your business. Make the most of it. So, we now know why Slovenia, we are small, we are smart, we are agile, and you can trust us. But now let's find out what about Poland. Why Poland? The overview of potentials of Polish business environment will be presented by Mr. Piotr Placha from Polish Investment and Trade Agency. Is Mr. Placha here? Please, I'm kindly inviting you to take the stage. The floor is yours. So we have presentation here. So, warm welcome from Poland, this, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this uh, presentation is, uh, contains uh, more than 40 slides, so I think it's, uh, we have not enough time to present all of, all of this. Uh, so, I will focus on uh, to present uh, the six reasons uh, why to choose Poland uh, as a uh, country of uh, investment uh, with great investment potential. 
Uh, Poland is uh, ranked very high in uh, international uh, ratings. So uh, we are quite resistant to, 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 to crises with also very high um, uh, growing uh, GDP rate. So looking on macroeconomics environment, uh, we, can, we can see the, the, the great history of, uh, um, of good, foundation, good business foundations uh, uh, of our economy, uh, starting uh, from uh, the beginning of the uh, 80s uh, in, in 20th century, with good, good prospects for the future, of course. Uh, some number, looking on some numbers, uh, uh, we can see that uh, um, Poland is uh, uh, one of the countries with uh, um, uh, competitive, uh, great competitive environment. Uh, also, very interesting uh, factor: uh, looking for trust, because trust is also very important in business. So. The um, uh, corruption index is also uh, quite positive in Poland. If we are looking on foreign direct investments in Poland, we also are ranked uh, very high looking on uh, our region, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, what PAI represents is a part of uh, uh, government support for our business. It's also very important. Uh, the Polish uh, the, the PAI agency, uh, which I represent, is a part of uh, of the of the system of support for Polish companies doing business abroad. Uh, uh, we are a part of the of the group of uh, agencies. Uh, we are responsible for two. Uh, two streams of, of this support, uh, uh, I, I mean uh, matching of businesses between Polish and foreign companies and also uh, mm, uh, welcoming uh, direct investments in, in Poland. Here we can see the effect of, of uh, uh, European funds uh, um, uh, for Poland. The second reason is uh, uh, also a strategic location. We, uh, we, we just uh, a couple of minutes ago we, uh, we have occasion to see how uh, Slovenia is uh, is located. Uh, uh, as Mr. Ambassador mentioned, uh, we, we we are the same. We are the part of the of the same part of Europe. Very important uh, uh, for the whole uh, um, European environment. So we share the same history. We share the same ideas and uh, uh, and business opportunities. Both our countries are located in the heart of Europe, so uh, this potential uh, is coming from, the, from, from this uh, situation. Our infrastructure is uh, very well developed, so uh, we are the part of the European uh, uh, transportation infrastructure. It's still growing, of course, so it is a, a good occasion to, to, to invest also in this infrastructure. What is very important for, uh, from a logistical point of view, we have a uh, well-developed uh, uh, inter, uh, intermodal uh, infrastructure for transportation. Uh, we are the part of, uh, let's say, New Silk Road. So, uh, as Mr. Ambassador said, uh, that uh, now we, uh, uh, we, we, we can see that, that uh, um, uh, Business exchange between West and East is uh, uh, it, it's very important, but also uh, the, the, the other direction from South uh, to North uh, 
Mauricio. He is the Gdańsk mentioned also uh, before. Uh, he is the um, uh, alternative or the second uh, vision of transportation infra infrastructure also. Uh, at the moment, uh, what is built is a, a route from the north to south. So via Carpathia and via, ba uh, via Baltica uh, routes uh, playing key role in international transport in this uh, direction uh, from south to north. The third uh, reason is uh, human capital. Uh, it's also very important. 92% uh, citizens uh, uh, with uh, at least secondary uh, education. What is uh, um, very important to mention is the very high position uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, PISA uh, knowledge survey. It's uh, representing the, uh, uh, the maturity of educational system. And here we can see that uh, both Poland and Slovenia uh, has uh, above average because average uh, score is uh, less than uh, 500 points. So uh, each position above uh, 500 is very good position, uh, representing the, 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 the effect of educational systems. So it's also a very important uh, indicator to. Um, uh, uh, to be taken into account when we are talking about uh, the foundations uh, for, for, uh, for a good economy and, and good cooperation, especially international uh, cooperation. Poland is also a very interesting country because uh, many uh, new ideas uh, in terms of e-commerce or uh, future solutions uh, uh, adapted by people uh, were uh, tested in Poland actually, for example, seamless uh, payments. And uh, what we've seen that uh, people uh, very positively welcome such solutions. So this, it gives us a, 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 a good vision for the future. And I think many of discussions today and tomorrow will be connected with this, uh, uh, with this um, uh, issue. So Poland uh, has uh, a lot of experience uh, in implementation of such new ways of payments, uh, new way of uh, uh, making transactions uh, in e-commerce. Knowledge of foreign languages as a, as a good foundation of cooperation is also very important. Uh, we have also a good position and, and growing in this field. The fourth position is um, uh, that uh, Polish people are a very inter uh, innovative nation, so it's also another uh, field of, uh, of, of the same ideas we share uh, in Poland and, and Slovenia. I'm trying to find what, what can be interested, not to uh, the presentation to be, to be, uh, to be shorter. Sorry for that, that I, can, I have not, not enough time to, to choose uh, the slides before. The, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the reason that I, I, I'm trying to find something interesting. What is the Poland's hobby horse? Uh, it can be very interesting for, for uh, our discussions. It's uh, um, research and development. This is one of the area which Poland is very strong, and uh, what is the, the good uh, point for the for the future cooperation is is the field of R and D. Uh, that's why Poland is uh, a very good um, environment for startups. Uh, the, the same situation is Slovenia. We also we also try to to uh, to invest in startups, uh, scale-ups because definitely is the future. 
especially to create uh, the, the um, a good environment for growing of such companies because the, the crucial is, uh, uh, as we know well, is the first year of, uh, of living of such companies. That's why it's very important to give them uh, support from the government and from uh, uh, big companies. What is, uh, I have personal, my personal experience from a big telecom company, Orange, is uh, that the very good practice is to create a, a friendly environment around a big company to, to create and to, um, uh, to grow uh, startups uh, uh, having the, the, the support of, of the bigger company. So, uh, global companies uh, trusted Poland also, locating uh, his facilities and his uh, bureaus in Poland. Uh, the Warsaw as the capital of, of, the, of the city uh, if someone have occasion to visit Warsaw, uh, can see how fast uh, uh, this city is growing. The fifth reason, uh, reason is uh, uh, expertise in many sectors in, of industry. Of course, not uh, uh, only a couple of them are mentioned here. First of all is the business service sector. This is a very, very interesting and important sector of, of, the, of the economy uh, because this is a good occasion to be, the, um, uh, to be the place for the global players to, uh, to locate uh, in Poland their, their, their business service support. It's one of, the, one of our specialty. Second one is uh, um, uh, automotive sector, um, uh, which is uh, also a very important part of the, of the economy and very important um, opportunity for the future, especially when we take into account, uh, for example, new fuels like hydrogen is the, one of the topics uh, which in the future can uh, and steadily growth and being uh, more and more important. The third Polish specialty is the gaming sector, so definitely connected with our, our today's discussion because um, when we are talking about e-commerce uh, and um, uh, especially cybersecurity, uh, uh, when uh, it's strictly connected with uh, also uh, gaming sector. Very strong uh, wing of, of Polish economy is uh, we, we are the major part of the of the global uh, supply chain for aviation sector, with more than for, uh, 140 aviation related companies. So we are the, the major part of the of the international uh, supply chain for for this sector. And what is strictly connected with the, with the future policy uh, of, of, um, of energy is the renewable energy sector. This is also, uh, we, we have also very strong components in this area with uh, quite big um, energy investments. So this is the very interesting field for, for the co international cooperation. Here are a couple of uh, examples of uh, global companies uh, uh, investing in Poland. So the, the, the major uh, uh, producer of, of batteries, for example, uh, or uh, engine plant for, uh, by Daimler. Okay. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Plaha, for your in-depth presentations of uh, Polish economic sector and business environment. And uh, of course, also the efficient one. If I would be given the task to present 
this presentation, believe me, we will be here. We would be here until tomorrow. So it's time to put focus of this event to digitalization and digital transformation. Digital technology is changing our lives in every possible aspect. Digitalization and digital transformation is next to green transition also a cornerstone of EU's development strategy in the current programming period. And the EU strategy, digital strategy, aims to make this transformation work for people and businesses while helping to achieve its target of a climate neutral Europe by 2050. But how to get there? How to support, how to stimulate, and how to promote the digitalization and the digital transformation? This topic will be addressed in our panel discussion with experts, and the panel discussion will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Uros Just, uh, who is Brother Assurance Service Director at Price Waterhouse Coopers Slovenia. Mr. Uros Just is an expert with tens of years and tons of experience, experience in various aspects of IT and information technologies, information security, IT audit, cyber security, security reviews, privacy, policies, standards, compliance, etc., etc. So let me also present and kindly invite all the panelists to take your chairs. Mr. Krzysztof Schubert, High Representative of the Polish Prime Minister for European Digital Policy. Mr. Igor Zorko, Vice President of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Slovenia and Ms. Katia Mohar-Bastar, the Director of the Digital Innovation Hub of Slovenia. Welcome. So as mentioned, digitization, one of the hot topics today. We, we are talking about it a lot in theory, but now is the time to see how different countries are implementing that into practice. What we're going to focus on today's uh, first panel is going to be the way of how to help kickstart and support those uh, activities to kind of help SMEs and everyone else progress in this area. With that, I would like to open the topic and um, actually maybe start with a question to Mr. Schubert. Um, your colleague has already said uh, uh, the, how highly he values your input. Uh, per our discussion, you have vast experience in business. Uh, and now in the governmental side, you are also very active on the regulations. So my first question to you would be, how do you see the EU regu regulations on digitization impact the future development of our countries? Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to start with a warm greeting from Mr. Shinsky. You've been mentioned during the first uh, speech. You couldn't be today because of the very important meeting in the Parliament. And yesterday he asked me to replace him today. So I hopefully will be able to provide you with the interesting insights as well from my perspective. Having said that, a um, few words um, about myself and my experience. Uh, that type of conference was for me especially interesting because I'm, I'm actually coming from the ICT space. So I'm, I'm the business person. So I spent 20 years in business, in the ICT business, being the CEO of different ICT compa companies in that part of Europe. I've spent a couple of years in consulting. With this experience, I've been asked by the Minister of Digital Affairs to provide the advice and also provide the two uh, strategic documents and develop two strategic documents for the ministry. And, 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 and that was my start with the administration. I'd be asked by the minister to execute those documents. So I started five years ago with administration. And later on, I've been on two positions in the government uh, as a secretary of state and the government plenipotentiary for digital single market. So in the end, I've been also coordinating the number of deputy ministers in our cabinet because we realized very, very soon after I took the position that digital single market has the biggest European strategy touching a lot of very different fields across all the, um, the, the cabinet. So just to give you an example, the strategy, digital single market, the old, old, old name of the strategy, we, at the time we had in our cabinet 18 ministers and 12 been touching this strategy. It was really clear the coordination in this space, also on the European level, will be the key uh, to succeed. So th that was the start, and later on I spent the last three years also on the Oxford University, 
uh, being also the advisor to the Secretary General of United Nations in New York, then back to Poland, and at the moment I'm advising the Prime Minister within the digital space, being the high representative of the, of the Prime Minister for European Digital Policy, and also I'm the president of the biggest venture capital fund in Poland. So having said that, this is uh, because that type of event, which are mostly like a business forum, in my opinion, is something like connecting people, connecting ideas, and connecting future ideas. That's the reason I give you the, my background, but maybe later on we'll find the ways or areas we can work together, especially that we had a very good today meetings with uh, your administration, with the local administration, with your ministers, and there is a number of areas we can work together. So that was the start, and back to your questions. So, European digital policy. So, uh, as you know, there is quite a lot of files at the moment, actually prepared by the president's, Slovenian presidency, and we are really very positively satisfied with the job you've been done providing those files and put them on the table in the, in the European Commission. I'm speaking about the Digital Services Act, the Data Governance Act, let's say new edition of the NIST Directive, Artificial Intelligence, EID and future concept of European EIDs. So there's really a lot of files on the table and we have a work for, a, for the, at least next two years to, to really implement them and have them really done and implemented. So, so it's important to work together on the European, on the European level. So the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that, that also I would like to mention the formal and informal European formats. We, we can work together, I mean Poland and, and, and Slovenia. There are quite a few um, as political formats mentioned by the ambassador like a three C's and there is a lot of digital products which are within three C's. There is a three C's digital highway as a main direction and now we build on that maybe quite few different services, ideas, develop the infrastructure coming from the simple, let's say, telecommunication infrastructure like uh, cables or 5G or next G just to have a bandwidth to move and uh, allocate more and more data or maybe some more advanced also um, uh, infrastructural uh, uh, areas like HPC, high performance computing, we are creating more and more data that might be also the, the, the area to work on quantum computing in the future, maybe quantum communication as a, something, something which will be really interesting from the cyber uh, is a perspective mentioned today as a one of the most important. So I, maybe I will start with this very short introduction and later on we will follow on on certain areas. So that's from my side at this round. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Igor Zorko, you're a representative of our uh, local Chamber of Commerce. Um, looking at uh, the directives that are coming our way, what is, uh, what is the, the thing that the Chamber of Commerce considers as the highest priority in the field of digitalization? Um, <coughs> we in Slovenia, do you hear me? Okay, B better. Okay, nice. Um, maybe just to just, you know, we, we have in Slovenia, we have two very different, but at the same time very uh, similar associations. One is Chamber of Commerce, which is representing the Slovenian companies. This is, we have about 100,000 companies. Um, relatively a small portion of these companies are big companies. So in Slovenia, we have just 400 big companies. All the others are specialized in some niche uh, fields. And, but we have a lot, so we are very d d uh, covering a different kind of, of fields and at the same time uh, working in different places in Slovenia, so we don't have one centralized uh, position of the companies. But on the other side, we, uh, Slovenia, we also have very good developed ICT uh, environment, so we have more than 20,000 IT experts working in about 3,500 Slovenian ICT companies. So this is for 2 million people nation, relatively big, uh, a big portion of Slovenian, Slovenian experts. But at the same time, we have a, a additional 20,000 people, experts, IT experts working in um, companies who are not digital companies. So like banks, uh, insurance companies, production companies, we have a lot of a lot of good centers for the region where the, these specialized um, 
technologies are developed also partially digital technologies. Why I'm explaining that? Because we are trying at the same time to promote our ICT environment and companies and their services and solutions. And the, the other side, we are trying to push uh, the digitalization into small and medium companies because it's a very big problem. They don't understand, all the companies, they don't understand what digitalization is bringing to the table. Um, what they have to do, that everybody know how to buy a machine for a new production, but what you have to invest at the same time um, to, to be digitalized, to, be adapt, to adapt to the new environment, at the same time to adapt to the new regulation, this is coming, um, you cannot, uh, uh, run out of it. So we are here. Um, at the same time, we have the new possibilities because we are getting the uh, single European market also for digital solutions, for the uh, regular industry and for the, all the others. And um, we at the same time are, have to bring a new competence to the table. So the managers, the, the administrative workers, the public servants, everybody has to learn how to automatize, how to be more how to, um, friendly with the digitalization to the users, to the environments, to the business community. So we have a lot of tasks. Um, and uh, we don't have enough manpower, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough time, but we have to do it quickly. Europe is now um, bringing to the table 21, I think, files on digital regulation. We have to change about 100 laws, other laws, not digital laws, here in Slovenia. Um, we don't have enough manpower in the public administration to cover all the fields that we have to change. All the regulation we expect to be more agile and adaptive to the change so we can uh, change it quickly. We saw it in the, in the COVID time. We have to do it, but at the same time, we have to respect the, the, the people and uh, their votes in the government, parliament, and so on. So it's not just take another step. We cannot go back. So we have to do it smart. We have to do it adaptive to the to the environment and to the to the public, all the public. So a lot of questions, a lot of problems. But maybe for the end, I think it's very important that this new regulation. I think we are the first in the world that we want to regulate as a Europe. We want to regulate digitalization. Um, um, for the people and with the people and I think it's also pushing the Slovenian regulators to do it quicker than they would do it otherwise and at the same time they can see also the good practices with other, uh, with other states because until now we everybody every state did the regulation on themselves and we don't have a lot of cooperation on the regulation and for example we were in Poland a month ago we talk about this also about the sea region because we have very similar problems. We are small countries, we have small companies, we work on the global technologies. We don't want to be closed in EU, but at the same time we want to have this all the new EU reg uh, regulation because we want to respect the people, we want to respect their, how to say, uh, their data uh, and so on, everything that's bringing to the table. So. A lot of problems, but at the same time, I think we are the first on this part of regulation. We are the first in the world, and I want us to be a good practice for all the other countries, also China and U.S. and all the others. So the small country being a good uh, example for the big ones. I think if we are not maybe the first or the the, uh, the most agile continent on the world, but I think we want to do the best and by the people regulated environment also in the digital space and I think we are in a good way to go there, but a lot of challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Katia Moharbastar, uh, you are the di director of uh, the Digital Innovation Hub in uh, Slovenia. Uh, so from a practical perspective, you're, you're actually leading it here where things are happening. Can you relate to how do all these theoretical regulations come into fruition? How are things being done and how are you supporting the Slovenian companies doing that? 
Well, thank you. Actually, I will just uh, rely on my regulatory background as well. Uh, I was working at the uh, telecommunications regulator for uh, a couple of years, for a decade. And then I worked also for incumbent, but I was mostly in telecoms regulation. What is the basis, the infrastructure? Uh, well, now, when dealing with uh, SME uh, di um, digital transformation, uh, I'm looking at the regulation that it must be adopted in a really practical way, that um, uh, uh, regulators, authorities, and um, the companies, uh, they must have a dialogue, open dialogue, and uh, they must listen to, to each other. Because uh, when there is an open dialogue, then we can solve problems and we don't need uh, really um, laws which are not connected to the real situations. Because we all know that uh, digitalization is uh, closely linked uh, to the processes which are uh, for real burden for all the organization, let's face it. Uh, and um, when you have uh, limitations in those processes, you need to know them. You need to know clearly what are your uh, responsibilities, what are your rights. And uh, as a small company, you usually you don't have a bunch of experts behind you, legal experts or somebody who would translate some laws who are not really uh, taking into account uh, the to whom they might concern. And uh, so, I think that uh, authorities must, when they're bringing directives into national legislative, they must know who are they talking to, who, we, who are they, their end users. And in our case, when our end users are small and medium enterprises, uh, this must be really simple, really connected to the real situations and not to uh, add administrative burden uh, to really complex situations. So, uh, and of course, to protect uh, end users, uh, to protect uh, the data, and because Europe, they always said that um, uh, United States are the first one in, um, in development and Asia, and the Europe is the first one in regulation. But right now, uh, as I understand, uh, a lot of countries, uh, even not European countries, are looking at European regulation not only to uh, be present on European market, but also because uh, they understand that uh, that enables human rights and that enables really secure environment for everybody. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Schubert. Uh, the one I really interesting discussion we had before was uh, when we were talking about all these concepts. There's one funding that comes usually from Europe or from the governmental side, but you also mentioned that you have a, a different way of. Um, acquiring funds to kind of sponsor all these activities. Would you uh, please explain a little bit yes, more sure. about that? Sure. Yes, so one comment because there was two very interesting points. The, always when we are also creating the regulation or the strategies, always we have to keep in, in the loop uh, the, the citizens and the small and medium-sized businesses. We are doing the same. Actually, most of the companies in Poland, like 99%, they are small and medium-sized businesses. So this is really very important. Also, we are discussing regulation to not over-regulate, yes, to not make them, that their life really easy and let them concentrate on the business they are doing than administration. Um, as, as you all know, the, we are in the front of the digital decade announced by the European Commission. So there is plenty of funds in different pockets on the European level. There is Digital Europe, very big uh, pocket, almost 10 billion euros for uh, artificial intelligence, cyber security, skills and competences, and HPC, high performance computing. There is Horizon Europe, new edition, almost 100 billion euros, more for science, development, research and development, and so on. So there's a lot of money on the European Union. In general, 20% of the all money from the recovery fund and other funds will be allocated to digital. So never in the past we had the access to such a big amount of money. But on the top of that, it's very important what we have invented in Poland a couple of years ago to also source or allocate quite a lot of money, public money, but, but using the venture capital funds. So we created a number of instruments like this. 
I have a pleasure to run the fund, which is the under NCBR, which is National Center for Research and Development, which is the executive agency of Ministry of Education and Science. So they decided the quite nice amount of money, 250 million euro, will be allocated to the fund for more aggressive and, let's say, more risky investment in the startups, companies, and the stage of development or trying to address other markets, no, not, not really the small startups, not small money like 100,000 something, but our ticket, our investment ticket is, for, is, is between 1 million euro to 15 million euro, which is in most of the cases we are covering most of the potential deals and startups which are interesting. In the presentation just, just before our panel, there was a couple of na names of the very big investment like a Booksy, and the Brainly and others, so they are tens of millions euro investment, or rounds even, so they are very big, but also the very important is to stimulate the, the smaller ones, because the most of them, um, they, are, they, are, they are in our region, in, in Central Eastern Europe, in Trisis and, and so forth. So, so this is uh, one of the examples how we created to not build something which is competitive to the market, because on each and every market we have a lot of funds already, venture capital funds. In Poland, funds which are in this space is around 100, so it's a lot of companies. So we decided, uh, speaking on the governmental level, that we don't want to build a competitive fund and fight with them on the customers, on the investments. We decided that it will be the co-investment fund. So first we are recruiting the partners, so each of these hundred might be our partner. If they are proved, we will do the due diligence, business due diligence, uh, uh, from the law perspective, due diligence, everything is clear. They are approved and then we are investing together. And the fund, which is always the company which is much longer than we on the market, and they are specializing in, in specific fields like digitalization or biotech or some other fields, they have a knowledge. There is no need for us to build the 100-member team of uh, investors and try to compete. So we would like to use their power and knowledge. We implemented this, this scenario a couple of years ago, actually the first scenario in 2018, providing the money from, 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 uh, in, in this way. And each and every year we are doubling the results. So it's very fast. For a long time it was quite flat. But from this moment we are doubling the results. So it's growing really, really fast. And at the moment, in the venture capital space or investment, the more than 70% of the money is from the public sector. They are public money. So they are really helping also to unlock the private money, which are not so big on the market. Sometimes the private investors, they do not know on the certain phase of the companies if, if this will be a success and let's say next Uber and the return will be times 600 or it will be completely lost, yes, of the investment. So it's, that's the way. Can I ask, how, how you get back the money? How the government, how, what is the, the way how you get back the money from the investment? From the investment? Yeah. At the moment we are at the stage of recruiting the partners. So we have, at the, at the moment we have 10 partners, five from Poland, so the partner funds, five from Poland, one from Austria, one from Hungary, one from Estonia, one from Latvia. And uh, at the, at, at, by the end of the year, we will be closing the first deals. So normally we are operating like a standard venture capital fund, but we are not created under a certain period. In most, normally in the venture capital, it's like five years period. We are like a green field, so we are working forever until we are creating value and investing money, building the portfolio. We have some, of course, KPIs to reach and stuff like this, like a completely commercial company. I'm probably the most administrative person within the company because most of other uh, people I have, they are from the private funds or they are from the big uh, uh, international law companies like Dentons or, uh, or CMS, Cameron Makina. So they are really experienced people in M&A acquisitions and stuff like this. So it's completely purely commercial model based on the private money and we are helping other funds also to provide them with uh, with, with additional funds they may need. Because in the end, the scenario is that the partner found we, we come up with a project's idea, and we, if we are okay with this project, doing our, on both sides, due diligence of the project, we are providing half-half, and we are investing half-half, having shares in the company. And you can invest also in Slovenia? Yes, we can. We can invest everywhere in OECD, 
that, that's, that, that's also very important. We also request that, that there are some limitations. The company sh shouldn't be older than seven years from the first commercial sale. So that's, that's enough even in the biotech business, seven years from the first commercial sale. Uh, OECD as a region. Polish something inside. It must be people or, or found or, I don't know, private investment. Because in the funds, in the private funds, all, always the founders also providing some money, like 2% of the total fund. So something um, uh, uh, like this and research and development component. So it is, we are not investing like a private equity, just buying, dividing company and sharing, sharing with a profit. But it has to be something which is which generates uh, potential development and, and, and stuff like this. And the model is really, really very well accepted on the market. We had a challenge to establish the model because from the second week I've been on the board, it was the first lockdown in Poland. So the, this is the first probably found so far completely created in the uh, online perspective, in the remote perspective. So it's very interesting uh, experience. Will you function also as a consortium for bigger tenders in Digital Euro program and similar? Sorry? Yeah. Um, will you function as well as a consortium for the, some uh, in tenders? In some of the area. So we are providing help. We are also, because of our, let's say, unique position and, 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 and place, there is a lot of project which is coming directly to us. So we are moving this project to our partners. We are also providing them with so-called leads. So in that way, we are showing them the way that we can get the money in this. They can get the money from the European program like uh, Horizon or Digital Europe help them to create the coalitions, even point the universities or partners outside of Poland to create this multinational coalition to be potentially much more successful applying for money. So that, that we are doing as a package of working with us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, as I said, I thought it was going to be an interesting uh, topic, uh, I guess. Thank you for co-moderating co with me and helping me drive the discussion further. Uh, we felt like this was maybe a good example to also share with our Slovenian uh, people because it sounds like a very unique uh, idea of how to approach this and something that could be replicated probably to some use. Um, Igor, before we were mentioning how we have two bigger segments, so larger companies and smaller companies, usually, especially in the space of uh, cyber or digitalization, we can expect the bigger ones to already know about this or have some funds allocated. It's the SMEs that usually lag behind. What are the kind of key, what is the key vision of how to influence, uh, inform, and educate SMEs that digitalization is something that really needs to be taken care of and that this doesn't, doesn't just mean having Zoom meetings instead of live meetings, but actually deeper impact of that process. I will promote the Digital Innovation Hub now. <laughs> um, I think it's very important that uh, uh, institutions, associations, Chamber of Commerce and Spirit, for example, and the Ministry of uh, Economy and Industry here in Slovenia, we together did the project or Digital Innovation Hub, for example, when we want to see what, there's, uh, what the economy is lacking, what industry is lacking here in Slovenia, and then prepare some measures like vouchers or co-financing or this kind of uh, investment um, simulations, um, also for the small, small and medium companies. Um, and this um, voucher system was very good accepted here in Slovenia. Every day we have hundreds and hundreds telephone calls on, on Chamber of Commerce and all the other associations because it's some kind of uh, push uh, to, this, to this new area of digitalization. Uh, for a few thousand years you don't get a lot, but you have the first step in. So you prepare digital strategy for the competencies, for the changing of your digital processes and this kind of terms, uh, starting this formation. And I think this kind of cooperation and uh, have some kind of support of this kind of ide ideas is very important. Also, the, the, it's important that the government in, understands this change also in, in the society, economy, and public administration. And we have now a new um, um, government service for digital transformation. So some new ministry or coordination body in Slovenia, and in Slovenia we have a lot of pillars. So for the industry, for the, for the uh, society, for the health, and so on. 
And I think we now see that everything is connected. So if you want to have a good worker on the workplace, you have to have educate, uh, good education. At the same time, you have to change your home environment. You have to move differently between the areas where you work because you can do it uh, from your home in Ljubljana, maybe in Maribor or vice versa. So you, ca you don't need to go there. So the movements of people, the, the workplaces are changing and so on. This is connected to regulation. This is connected to the technology. This is connecting on different payrolls, how to pay the people. So I think we are in the same, okay, bad word, shit together. Um, and I think we have to cooperate. And the first results, I think, it's seeable here in Slovenia. Also, Digital Innovation Hub is one, one, um, this kind of example. Um, but we have to move quicker. We have to um, promote it better. We have to change the state of mind of the people who work in our companies because at the end of time, everything is is uh, on the people. So the people are most important, not the machines, not the not the buildings, but the people are our asset and the knowledge they have, I think, is the future. Now in digital era, this is the, the, the most important. Uh, one thing maybe for before, Slovenia is a bit specific for the investment in digitalization because we don't have a big uh, bunch of people. We don't have a lot of, um, a lot of experts or the big population. And we are looking for investments in research and development companies, niche companies who are mostly not producing something, but are uh, trying to develop something new, have new ideas. Um, and we don't need a lot of money, but we need partners and we need market. Mm -hmm. so, so I think this kind of cooperation uh, from between Poland and Slovenia, because you are used to uh, build a volume size business, and we are used to build the so small niche products we sell then in Silicon Valley or something else because we don't know how to get to the market. This kind of uh, opportunities, I think, we can discuss in the future also. And it would be great. Nice. It would be great, really. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 perfect. Thank you. Um, I already got some clues <laughs> and some promotions. So. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, just to uh, complement maybe Igor's uh, answer. Uh, actually, Dix Slovenia is um, some, some, some kind of um, support environment, uh, especially for uh, SMEs uh, di digitalization. Uh, vouchers, we are, we are supporting uh, SMEs for, for the vouchers, for, uh, as you said, uh, digital strategy, digital marketing. It's not only strategy for the marketing, they already get the um, product. Either is it a mobile application, or is it a website, or a web shop, or whatever. And then we also have special voucher for cybersecurity. Uh, I also saw authority on cybersecurity there in the audience, um, probably for the next roundtable, uh, and uh, also digital competences. We do uh, the vouchers uh, now for uh, two years. And we see that um, more and more awareness uh, is raised uh, during uh, our work. And also, uh, not only vouchers, we have uh, wider um, competences here because uh, our, one of our tasks is also to build an ecosystem. With our partners, uh, Spirit, uh, Spirit Slovenia, uh, Ministry for Economic Development and Technology, and BTC City, uh, uh, we actually established this place we are in today. Uh, this is called Slovenian Digital Center and is, uh, um, is for the time of the Slovenian presidency to the EU Council. And uh, also for half a year we uh, divided the program into six monthly topics. So uh, this, this month uh, we have digitalization, digital transformation, uh, but we also covered uh, smart citizen society, sustainable society, uh, artificial intelligence, where by the way I must mention that we have a a lot of experts in artificial intelligence because it's a really, really old thing in Slovenia. Uh, in uh, Josef Stefan Institute, uh, they are dealing with it for the last 30 years. 
and they have also UNESCO uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence called IRKAI here in Slovenia and it's really interesting thing uh, to see what they do. And uh, we also have 5G and cyber security and uh, we will conclude next month with Industry 4.0 and uh, robotics. So yes, we tried to cover the main areas of digitalization so we uh, invite companies who are dealing with certain areas to ex exhibit in this big hall and then we have events in that uh, smaller hall as well and uh, I think that uh, as I've heard from our participants they really like this environment and it is something for the networking and for meeting people also internationally and locally because uh, there is a place where you can meet somebody for, from public administration you really wanted to see for a long time and uh, it's really hard to get to pass the secretary but you meet, meet them at the events here despite the COVID <laughs> and uh, yes uh, I think that uh, uh, things like this uh, are really participating to raising awareness to building the ecosystem so um, yes thank you yeah that was kind of the question I wanted to ask like how do you see the future and stuff so we're very interactive I, I love this um, it's really great place, by the way, because it reminds me a couple of years ago, the first time I visited Estonia, because the, they are known as being very digitalized, relatively small country with a focus on digitalization, and they, they built actually the, quite a similar center dedicated to the digital events. So for me, it's like... Uh, we, we would like here to build some kind of community centers in different parts of Slovenia, where the people can meet at the same time, accept the digitalization and learn how to do it. Um, the Estonia is a bit different because they have one big city and exactly. very not populated environment. Otherwise, Slovenia is equally um, populized in all the country. So we don't have a one big city. Yeah. So we need more places. We need more, how to say, going to the to, into the local local communities, to the small cities, villages more than cities, um, because we don't want the people to move from these small villages and from all the parts from Slovenia. And as we did 40 years ago, we moved the industry to the local environments because Slovenia don't have a big industry here in Ljubljana. We have it in Gorenska, in Primorska, so in all over the Slovenia. And this was very good accepted by the peoples. And we w would like to do that very seamlessly also with the digitalization because the, the banks are moving from the rural areas. The, everything is, is coming to the center, but virtual environment and community center can stay locally. Mm. So, so I think this kind of approach would be very good and also for small and medium companies to stay there to pr produce something. Very good idea. A couple of years ago we had not a similar, but quite a similar. We decided the old libraries to also create from them like uh, training centers for the new technologies to install the first computers and high-speed internet and really help people to be up to date with the technology. So it's, it's really, really helpful and we had the same uh, problems uh, from the ge geographical perspective because Poland is the same number of, of, of cities and population split equally uh, across the country and even worse in, in the very small villages, not like in uh, Switzerland for example that all the houses are around the crossing of the roads and the fields are in the back. We have opposite, so one house there, one house another hill. So from the you know high-speed internet and cable connection is quite expensive, and uh, we had to create some ideas. But we created four years ago a program to connect uh, 30,000 schools in Poland to the high-speed internet, and it was like a backbone. And from that, the last mile was under the different discussions. Yes, the commercial operator, not really commercial, but just to give the boost to really implement the. The, in the network. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, there is a question about the strategy, where to go and how to how to uh, do that. And now we see that we have to combine some small, uh, low-hanging fruit projects, which we can uh, very very quickly show to the people and to the to the all the all the Slovenians what can be the results. And this is uh, was strategic counsel of the government for the for creating this kind of small projects. And there is a lot of people from the business, from the universities, cooperating these small projects. But at the same time, we want to push this kind of approach, agile approach, in preparing the strategy of Slovenian digital transformation, mm -hmm. Digital Slovenia 2030. Yes. And because we want to go to the people, we, can, we want to help them. At the same time, be agile, 
be less administrative or how to say it. And uh, at the end, we want to have very clear goals, which we can monitor and which we, we can also change. Because the strategy for 10, 20 years is a problem. You can, you can have uh, some kind of plan for a year or two in digital area. Yeah. Uh, because the environment is changing, the world is changing. So we have to adapt also how to, how to pair a strategy. Strategy can be a vision. We have to know where we are going, but which path we use, we have to change it every day. So we're very like, for example, UK approach when they implemented agile approach, not just in creating the digital projects or investing in this, but also how to do the strategy and how to build uh, the public uh, projects, not just private ones. So I think this kind of approach we are used to because we are all the time under some big umbrella of East or West, but we have to be agile mm. countries in this sea region and we have to use this kind <coughs> of experience, I think, in the future also. Yeah, that, that's, that's really true because um, I do remember like uh, five years ago there was the idea and we created the, the Ministry for Digital Affairs as a separate body. And uh, we had a long discussion how to prepare the strategy. At that time, I was not within the ministry or the opposite side in business. And they asked me to prepare two documents. And we had a long discussion. How, how, how would you like to see those documents if they had to be like nice uh, 200 pages document with people which are smiling and all the stuff, but or really the directions. And then the, the, the uh, output from the, from the minister was just to keep it as short as possible, just one a capit per idea, and I, we created like a two documents, one for Poland, one for EU, Poland in the EU, from the digital perspective, both documents. In total, both documents, 35 pages, 15 and 20. And we put it under the public consultation, officially, that we would like to follow that, uh, that priorities, we call it priorities, even not a strategy. Our priorities, and in the agile way, we've been changing that, because they are changing over the years. So we, in normally, when we are putting the documents in the digital space uh, to the public consultations, we have 10, 15, 20 maybe organizations or companies or NGOs provide us with a response. So on that very short, clear document, in the very, let's say, light language, it was not very technical, but very friendly language, we had over 500 responders. So to 35 pages, we received like 2,000 pages of ideas, improvements, and, st and it was really a great job because we processed all of that, implemented what makes sense, and executed. I can understand that because uh, usually when we get th those kind of documents, we have to do everything what is written in them. And if there is 200 pages, I don't know, you just have to take your time to read it. And if 35 pages, you, you can start working. <laughs> well. I'm really happy that we're exchanging all these best practices. And this is a, since we're slightly running out of time, I'm just going to finish off with one question. Uh, and it's going to be to Mr. Schubert because we are outnumbering uh, Poland here and we should give them a little more uh, attention. Um, another thing that I thought was very interesting is when we were discussing the e commerce products and the, the, the products that you already developed and are already implemented. Uh, when we're comparing best practices, could you tell us a little bit about the products that you already successfully launched in Poland or some that are just about to be launched? I, I will try to do it because the time is, is very, very limited. So actually, very important when creating new products or strategies is to involve people and business. So we created like a five years ago, at the almost at the same time, the documents I've mentioned, we created like a group, we call it a cashless paperless group. And it was a group of the combination of people from business and the government responsible for certain areas. It was like 13 teams. And uh, we've been able to convince people from the highest level from business, like uh, presidents of the telecoms, banks and stuff like depends on the area. So in the end, we had 300 people in this field and most of the products or ideas created, we've been able to implement and they've been successful. So from the other side, if we would take the decision, maybe at the time to create it in a commercial way, probably it would be one of the most expensive think tank in Europe. But they decided, all of these people, to really do it like a pro bono. So they provided the experience and really help us to deliver products. That was one of the reasons we decided to use a banking sector, just as an example. 
uh, we've been not sure how to create more trust to the electronic administration, and we decided that, that, that to the banking sector, which, which is still one of the, of the most advanced in, across Europe, in Poland is very advanced, so we, we decided that we will put some of the features, like a trusted profile, which is an electronic signature within the banking system. And most of the users, they trust to the banking system, the, the money they, are, they, they keep there, so they are trusting. So, so we put those features and the people starting. So in case of this trusted profile, this electronic signature, we started from the 300,000 users, mostly across administration at the time, and now we went to 13 million users yeah, over four years. It was a big increase. And other services in similar way, like uh, M Citizen, which is like a mobile application, mobile wallet with your uh, driving license, ID, and stuff like this. More and more functionalities we are putting. So this is uh, very important. And because we are running out of time, last, uh, last, last comment uh, uh, and invitation as well, because um, I'm not sure if you know uh, within three weeks, we are organizing in Poland uh, the biggest uh, digital summit under, under United Nations umbrella, it's called IGF, Internet Governance Forum, from the 6th to 10th December in Katowice. So one week of, of panels, discussions, and stuff like this. We have 300 panels there, and 4,000 people already registered to be physically in the, in, in the center. So if you will find time, it would be really great as a follow up of, on our meeting today to visit us there and maybe be active in one of the panels or during the roundtable discussions. Thank you. Um, I think we, we are officially out of time, so I would just like to thank all of you for participating in this. I think it was very educational, uh, so I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also from my side, dear panelists. Very fruitful discussion and very relaxed one, which is also important. And we are moving a little bit closer and a little bit, um, the focus a little bit more towards uh, more technical debate. Our next topic and debate will be about new technologies, innovative solutions in the field of digitalization and cybersecurity of Slovenian and Polish companies. Mr. Uros Just will host and moderate the debate with the following panelists. I'm kindly inviting to the stage and to the hot seat, first, Mr. Marco Pelhan, director of C Astral Company. The next I would like to invite is Mr. Mark Kalin, senior director at Collector Digital. The third panelists, Panelist will be Mr. Metod Platice, product manager at Telecom Slovenia. And fourth panelist will be Mr. Boguslav Skuza, head of Europe at Cybertech. Hello, everyone. I hope you're feeling fine. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Okay. So we started off with a more governmental view and focus more on digitization. Yeah, so the first fo focus of the first panel was more on the governmental side, on more on the regulatory side. Uh, now we're coming more into the business side. How are these concepts implemented? We're expanding the topic from digitization into cybersecurity and new innovative products as well. Um, thank you to all the panelists to be joining me today. Um, I would like to start uh, first with Mr. Platice, representative of Telecom Slovenia, uh, our biggest telco uh, in the country. An interesting part is Telecom being the telco company, how, does it, how did the transition into cybersecurity happen? Uh, was this something natural, organic? Was this something that was uh, observed by other telecoms or did you just see an opportunity to kind of go into this area? Uh, thank you, and uh, I would like to uh, say hello to all uh, the all audience from my side. So uh, that's a good question. So we started thinking about the cybersecurity more intense uh, in 2018. 
so the information security and IT security was uh, all the time very important for Telecom Slovenia as an uh, uh, IT and digital and te uh, telecommunication company. But uh, in 2018, we started thinking, so how to build this uh, uh, as a service as well. So maybe one could think that we uh, started uh, uh, doing uh, cybersecurity more seriously because of our uh, internal uh, requirements. But in fact, uh, we started from the business perspective and uh, tried to find out what the Slovenian companies and organizations uh, need in this respect. Uh, but then, so we talked uh, internally and decided that the philosophy, that the strategy would be to provide the security features and services as well for internal needs, so for the internal organization and as well for the, uh, for the market, for the business customers. And then we established uh, the Security Operations Center. It was the first uh, Security Operations Center in Slovenia and is still, uh, uh, I'm sure, the, the far most comprehensive one. Uh, and for example, this week uh, we onboarded the 60, uh, 61, the, the customer. Uh, and yeah, if I'm going back then, so we treated the telecom as one of our customers of the security operations center. So that was the starting point. And we need uh, quite some time to convince, I would say, not internally because we uh, were already decided to use it, but the, the companies outside uh, that they will need some shift from buying products, software, installing things to buying knowledge and to buying operational service to be really uh, safe, cyber safe, I would say. Uh, it took a year and a half to starting, uh, I would say, selling uh, these services, but now it's uh, growing a year, uh, from month to month. Uh, even more those customers are coming because they see that it is a great benefit that you have someone that they will take care of uh, your security and uh, they will uh, becoming more mature if they have someone to take care, to carry them toward this journey. Thank you. Mr. Scusa, you're, you, you didn't work for, you don't work for a telco, but your kind of basis is the same. Your company started off in the telecommunication services business and recently also moved into cyberspace. Can you relate to the story? Can you maybe explain how your company got into the cybersecurity sector? Okay, thank you for, for the question. Of course, uh, as we discussed before, uh, I'm not a technical person. I'm, I'm, I'm from the business, from the risk management side, from the insurance companies. So I understand the risk. The company I represent, the Cybertech, is the Singapore-based company created in 1987. So it has quite a long history. For probably good 22 years, 23, they were just telecoms, nothing else. But not telecoms as such to provide service, but to work with the telecom companies to enhance clients' experience, to improve uh, efficiency on whatever they were providing and the kind of satisfaction of the end customer. About uh, five years ago, um, when the previous owner, the Swedish person, decided to leave the company, the employees bought the company. So this is really management buyout operations, and the company is run by the employees, the previous employees. So they have extensive practice in telecom, but looking to the trends, to the developments, reading all the reports, the crucial thing is cybersecurity. <laughs> because dependency we have today uh, as all organization the governments, the states, the, the state agencies, business, uh, private people, is security of our own being in the network. That's what it matters at the end. <clears throat> so they went to the cybersecurity. They developed their very own, call it product, um, uh, which is now being offered widely in uh, South Asia, um, Africa, now in Poland for the last two years. Uh, so cybersecurity is really a topic, and uh, looking to the previous discussions we had, to what the comments from Igor, from Katya, uh, the SMEs 
this is really an ocean of opportunities. On the other hand, an ocean of problems because each and every company is different. They're small, they have their own way of doing business, they don't have budgets, they don't understand. At the end, they don't understand uh, what is really cybersecurity. We all read about uh, issues of Marriott Hotel, uh, the big banks being hacked, or Department of the States uh, being hacked, but very few know that most of the attacks is going to SMEs because they're the weakest. They don't have any protection at the end. In Poland, the study shows that only 3% of IT budget is going to the cybersecurity. 3% of the IT budget, so it's zero, it's nothing. We believe that if we buy clouds from Microsoft, then we save. I don't know, two months ago, attack on the clouds of Microsoft, dozens of thousands of companies exposed and their data. So there is no security as such in terms of, uh, let's say, technical aspect. The, te the security we need to build together, together with the business owners, but at the end it's about understanding the risk because there will be never 100% security. There will be never a company which is kind of immune to any attacks. The, the, the networks are leaving, the new techniques are coming. I just read recently that the new computing computers can hack any system because of their power. I mean, they have a, such a big computing power that they can hack any system. So what about the security? I think that the challenge is to, as uh, colleagues in the previous uh, panels were saying as well, is to educate, to make sure that people understand uh, why they need the cybersecurity, or at least to understand what risk they are exposed to, what may happen if something uh, or someone will hack their system. Is it reputation? Is it finance? Is it operation? Is it lost data? Is it delay in projects? Whatever. Because we don't treat about one uh, beacon payments, which is $60,000, for unblocking the web pages, yes? which is very common uh, uh, situation. Polish police reported 50,000 events hacking to the system in the year 2020. Five zero, 50,000 events per year. That's in Poland. That's half of SMEs that we have in Poland have been hacked somehow. So this is a big uh, problem and a growing problem for, for all of us. And this is kind of, kind of how you decided that this is going to be the yeah, focus? Yeah, I think that's you. why they decided, because they have seen that technology goes very fast and goes faster and faster because of these computing powers, new computers, supercomputers, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, all of that increase the speed of the change. Mm -hmm. And very few can follow, actually. The biggest, the, 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 the uh, most powerful in finance can, can, can follow because that's the big expense. I, I don't know, in Poland, the good cybersecurity officer will cost you six, 7,000 uh, euros, yes? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. who can afford it on SME side? Very few. Okay, thank you for the answer. Mr. Kalin, uh, you're the director of uh, uh, Collector Digital. Um, my question would be, Collector was a standard manufacturing company, very known for its classical ways. Where from does this passion for digitalization come into? How did this uh, start being important? And uh, basically, w what drove Collector <coughs> into these digital waters? Yes, first of all, thank you for, for having me, having us. So this is a great question. So first of all, Collector, as you know, is one of the biggest companies in Slovenia with more than 5,000 employees in close to, hopefully, will reach that 1 billion euro revenue per year. So uh, to transition this huge company towards digitization, innovation, robotics, AI was, was a, a big step. So we, we started in 2012 with implementing lean manufacturing. Uh, we started with the Lean Academy to educate our employees. Uh, then in 2016, we decided to develop our own uh, ventures. So a VC for, for startups, to invest in startups into new technologies. And we invested into five, five really great ideas. 
uh, that have turned into fantastic solutions for us. So the, the primary goal was to digitize Collector, Collector Group. Uh, we have 25 companies under our, our group and 11 competent centers. So it was quite important for us to, to diversify. As you know, Collector is one of the biggest players in automotive industry. Uh, pretty much every car has around 100 parts built by us, uh, manufactured by us. So, and we know that automotive industry is taking a huge step uh, towards mobility, autonomous driving, uh, energy efficiency, and uh, we, we, we sense the urge to, to diversify and to step into this digitization. And with Collector Digital, which was officially established in 2018, uh, we really started developing uh, different solutions. And I'm really happy to say that all these five startups that we invested um, a couple of years ago have great solutions, and all these solutions have been implemented in all 25 uh, manufacturing companies. So uh, to, to uh, make this answer short, uh, we, we sense the urge to diversify because we're strong into the automotive, into the power uh, energy segment, but we are not strong in the digitization. But with this step, now, our portfolio, our services, uh, our solutions are growing, and uh, the plan for this um, vertical collector digital is quite ambitious, and we hope uh, next year and the year after to really close that and, and, and that gap towards one billion uh, revenue and even surpass it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Pelhan. You come from a different background. You're more of an academical person, coming more from the R&D, yet you're a CEO of a company that produces uh, aeros, aeros, that is in the aerospace business, produces drones, high-tech, high very niche market. Um, how did you, from a, your educational background and this, come into this new technology, into such innovative uh, field? Well, thanks. Thanks for having me here, and um, thank you for the question. I mean, you know, for I, I was listening here about you know a company that started with cybersecurity in the '97 and so on, and uh, in my in my field, you know, I had to start to deal with uh, cybersecurity issues in the early '90s, right? As soon as the internet started, this was one of the things we actually had to deal with. It was. You know, when we established the first media lab in Eastern Europe, in Ljubljana, Ljubljana Digital Media Lab, one of the first, second. First one was in Budapest. But uh, as part of uh, the initiatives of the Open Society Foundation, one of the first things we had to deal with was cybersecurity of our servers and so on. Because we were immediately also under uh, a threat from state actors. Not here, but, you know, elsewhere. And uh, so this was uh, a natural environment, right? And um, the whole, uh, you know, uh, white hat hacking and black hat hacking scene was kind of part of what we had to grow with, grow up with when we were working in that domain. And that's, you know, it was a, a very, very uh, natural domain to live with, yeah? Uh, we also, uh, you know, in, in, in that, in those times, we were also probing the defenses of different systems that were supposedly secure. And one of the projects that I, I led, we, for example, exposed the uh, vulnerability of the Inmarsat satellite telecommunication system. This was 1997, and, uh, uh, which was deemed to be secure, but it was not. Yeah? And um, so a, a, lot, a lot of things happened in, in those years. So all of that accumulated kind of knowledge then uh, um, led me le uh, astray into the field of autonomous systems and robotics and so on. And that's how C Astral was formed. And again, in, in our company, we deal with uh, uh, cybersecurity issues from the first really contact with the customers. We are a kind of a, you know, a company that has customers both on the commercial side, but also security and defense. So those are very sensitive, sometimes also quite uneducated in that field. Uh, and uh, from day one, even from the first email exchanges, you have to be aware, you know, what you write, how you write it, where it goes, and so on. So we sometimes have to educate our customers 
uh, in terms of encryption and so on. So there are a lot of issues uh, uh, and sensitivities that we have to be aware of. And yet, it, it, it's a minefield yeah, out there. I mean, it's a, it's a really wild, I wouldn't call it wild west, I would call it, you know, uh, um, an, an ocean of wilderness, yeah, uh, with a lot of creatures. And um, I, I think it's a matter of education. You know, our children are now living on the networks. They have unfortunately no idea what it means to leave all of these traces and so on that can be mined, that can be used against them, maybe when they will be 20 years old and so on. So I think there's a lot we can do about education on the cybersecurity level. Of course, not to make everybody paranoid, but educate it. It's as simple as that. So, you know, in our company, of course, as I said, we deal with it uh, be for better or worse. We have been under attack. Actually, we are daily. Yeah, we are daily under attack, uh, uh, literally daily, and we let's say that our defenses are not so bad. One of our customers was just recently hacked and we were victims of a man in the middle attack and so on. We managed that, but it was a very interesting experience for everybody involved. Yeah, we didn't lose any money, nobody did, but uh, we learned from that experience. Okay, and then uh, talking about the products that you developed, uh, the technologies. Yeah, we, we, you know, currently we are kind of diversifying. You know, we are very, as you said, we are a niche company. We built unmanned robotic systems, or robotic aircraft, yeah, and uh, which need to communicate with the ground, and uh, that link is the weak link, yeah. So uh, we are securing those links uh, in all kinds of ways, and uh, that's a very important new vertical that we're developing. We actually, since Europe really does not have solutions. Uh, on that level, we, for the past five years, developed our own hardware, which we are launching in uh, the first quarter of uh, next year uh, for uh, um, data link communications with our systems. So that's going to be a very... I'm looking forward to open that market and see what happens. Uh, so another new technology, another, another new, new niche solution. product. Yeah, okay. coming from Slovenia. Uh, we'll see uh, how it goes. It's a very ingenious one, you know, as you know, Slovenia, look at Collector and even Telecom, I mean, you know, or in the old days, uh, Iskratel and all of that. There's a lot of knowledge here, yeah, and uh, a lot of good engineering. And uh, our particular solution comes from aerospace, from space communications. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll see, you know, we, we kind of adapted it to terrestrial uh, uh, uses. And uh, there's nothing like, you know, our colleagues in Canada and United States uh, have solutions. They are market leaders on, on that level. We don't aspire to, you know, compete directly with them. I and mean, there's some Polish colleagues too who are working on that. Uh, since Poland is maybe the strongest aerospace player in Eastern Europe, for sure. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a very exciting few years from now on. Thank you. Well, Mr. Scusa is actually also in the field of... Uh, By coincidence, I'm also sitting as a chairman of uh, CE for the drone manufacturing company. Uh, there we go. Produce. I'll be happy to exchange some... So I think the, the B2B part <laughs> after this panel is going to uh, be a very interesting uh, one. I guess that's the point of us meeting here. Yeah? <laughs> there's not a lot of audience, but, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, this yeah, is always good. Discussion. Yeah, so, looking forward. Okay. Um, this question, I actually want to ask both of our uh, cybersecurity services providers, and uh, both companies kind of mostly specialize on SMEs, because larger companies usually kind of take care or often decide to build their own capacities. It's the SMEs that actually need help to, to have as, uh, SOC support or to have the products. In your opinions, uh, what are the things that you see working on the market, working with SMEs that are kind of the, the critical ones where they're lacking the most in cybersecurity space? What are the main threats and would be kind of, at the previous panel we were talking about the low hanging fruit, where could the, these companies benefit the most with the least invent, investment or uh, kind of with the biggest ease? Yes, okay. So uh, when we are approaching a company, 
So the companies that we are serving are uh, from the small, medium, the big ones, and so on, so the whole spectrum, and also from the different industries as well. So then each company has its own DNA, I would say, but we can put them in the certain boxes, okay? And uh, although we may say that the small companies are less prepared, it's not always so. So there are differences between them, but we may average this. And uh, yes, small, medium companies don't have resources, don't have uh, security engineers. So they are focused on their business. Uh, and although they are aware that maybe some other companies of the same site or the same sector has been breached or has been uh, the, uh, so maybe some uh, direct or fraud has happened to them or something like that. They are typically not doing the, the step toward the, the, the security uh, if they are not uh, have uh, this experience maybe. Many companies that we talk uh, with uh, said we uh, think that this is happening to someone, to some other, to some other companies. But when they experience this, they, this is a really pain. And you know, so then uh, immediately go buying some servers, uh, hardware, uh, uh, installing uh, this. But uh, when we are talking with them, so uh, we emphasize that uh, only the technology is not the solution. So they need proper engineering. They need they need to know where are uh, where the crown jewels uh, of the companies uh, reside. So they have to focus on that first. And uh, we find during the discussion two, three things that they have to done first, and they then develop. They focus on on uh, step by step. So to uh, how to say the. Um, uh, the, the cyber environment to, to, to develop during the years. Uh, the difference is with the big companies. They say they have uh, their own IT and the security teams. But if you uh, remember years ago when the companies have their own IT operation teams, so they have big machines like IBM, DEC, and so on, and they have operation teams, they change the tapes, uh, they doing the printing, whole bunch of papers and so on. Uh, for years, there is no operation teams in IT anymore. Because why? There is uh, uh, automatization and all, all these tasks are uh, automated and uh, there is the high level of, uh, I would say, um, so the systems are, are stable. If something is broken, they typically don't affect the, the services. And what the companies now need in IT is the technical support, is some, uh, some uh, uh, people that come if something breaks and so on, but it does not affect the service. But in the security, the, the things are opposite. Though the risk in the security area is going up, and we cannot cope the security risk with the technology uh, only. So we have to bring some operational, uh, operational uh, people, operational uh, uh, staff to take care of the events that is happening all the time. So you know that when you discovered something going wrong, you have to you have to analyze it. You have to dig deeper into it. You have to find out what's going wrong, and we have to remediate this. So the the people, the knowledge of these people is key here. Uh, okay, um, I don't want to forget to, so we are talking about the business, but the, the regular people, the, uh, the normal uh, users of the phones, for example, that uh, we are providing to, to them the communication services. So let's say we established a service that is blocking the user if he is trying to go to some malicious website. So this is a very simple service, but is very, very efficient. And uh, this blocks, let's say, 80 per or, or more percent of the threats that are uh, everyday people exposed to. So there are re really a big range of measures that we can put in our services, on top of our services, to protect our users. Okay, thank you. 
fully agree. I, I, I guess education is the key to any success in this in this field of cybersecurity. And uh, perhaps negatively saying, more experiences. So more and more people will see that this um, space is dangerous, that it could really harm the business or put business out of completely out of business, yes, because of, of the de demand for the cybersecurity. Uh, so our, from our perspective as, as cybertech, I think this is the, the key element we are focusing to try to explain why they need to really, at least to understand. Because when you understand the risk, you may decide properly or not, but you decide. If you don't understand the risk, you, you just live in the sky. I mean, you, you believe whatever you hear or you read or someone, uh, you know, is trying to convince you to, that your business is safe. The, the problem I find is that, of course, there is a completely different communication language between IT guys and call it normal people, I don't know, managers, directors, owners, etc. Sometimes it's a, just a generation gap because all the smart people are young people, yes? The guys who are under 30, uh, 35, oldest. I'm 60, over 60. I mean, this is a completely gap in, you know, when we and how we communicate, what I understand from their language. I can read that document, but I don't understand it. I need to find another way of communicating to understand the risk. Uh, that's why the tool we develop, which is helping basically both sides. One, uh, to open this communication on kind of ground level, so we could understand each other on the same uh, level. And uh, giving me, as a non-technical person, an access to the information which is uh, easy to understand, but also visibly showing me what's wrong or what's good. What's wrong with the system, how many uh, you know, um, risks I can discover, how important are those risks, but also what can I do with them? And then I have a technical person who actually takes all those risks and can manage them in the proper way. Say, okay, this one I will do this month, next one I do the other one, and this for the next year because the budget is needed, yes? So there is a, a, a practical tool where I can monitor the work of my IT director or person who I'm hiring uh, as an outsource service to show that the quality of the work I'm getting is good and the money I spend is well spent. Uh, so my sense of security is at the same level or it's improving or it's going down. I think this is what's the, the critical part, to convince both sides that they need to talk and talk the same language. Because what we see in Poland is that there are two types of directors, the IT directors. One which are taking the tool and go to the higher level saying, I need budget. Because you see there are so many points that I need to cover and I need to improve. And the other one is saying, um, you know, the guy will see everything. He will be able to tell me that I'm better a good guy in, in every single day because he can see every single thing which is wrong, which I haven't done in the proper time. I have done it, but it's not completely com taken away. So in that sense, uh, this is very personal uh, way. And people were saying here at the beginning, we need to have a trust, yes? And uh, the trust to our teams that they know what they do and they do it in the a, in a best way, possible way, given the resources we allocate, etc., etc. And, and I think that's what we do. Um, the effort goes to education, the effort is, goes to experience, so we do all, lots of those POCs, the proof of concept, to show people what is the value of that. If they buy, excellent. If they don't buy, Fine, but at least they understand. That, I think, the, the effort we are putting to, trying to convince those uh, SMEs, because this is, as you said, this is a very large segment and very diversified segment. We have a very small company in Poland, but they are providers of, of a very niche part to um, Rolls Royce uh, engines. So these guys are really here with the cybersecurity, yes, because it's acquired by the, by the partner. Partner that uh, requires them to be really on the top notch on the cybersecurity, and they are, but many are not really there for whatever reasons, historical reasons, 
lack of understanding, the budget, today the COVID, the, you know, lots of those things. Will I survive? Would I have money to pay my people? So investments were not really, or even spending, kind of operational spendings were kind of under really uh, big uh, limitations. But hopefully that's over. We know how to live in this new environment. And hopefully there's more and more proofs that uh, these guys are understanding and taking forward. Uh, it's going to be a long way, like everything. Any change in people's mind is a long way. Um, outsourcing services, giving up, you know, people. Because in previous operations, the more people you had, the bigger you've been, yes? It's not about people. It's about the knowledge of the teams you have. It's about the ideas you have. It's about the way you create your market and how you position yourself. It's not the people. Today, you buy lots of knowledge outside, and that's normal business way. Yes? Hopefully, also, that will be with the cybersecurity. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've, since we were talking about niche companies, I wanted to ask you, um, being a CEO of a niche company, a smaller company, how important is, it, is the ability to adapt, to kind of follow the trends, to follow the, the regulation on how to be more digital, be more innovative, be more secure? For success, you know, you, usually as a niche company, you have to kind of lead the way yeah, in in this. Uh, we create the trends, which sometimes just don't have the ability to establish them, really, right? So it's very important. And and um, being a small company, you can control some of the risks much better than in a larger environment. That's for sure, yeah. Because maybe you know, in, if we talk about cybersecurity, maybe your weak point is just you know, few people. Literally, right? It's people, on a people level, it gets down to that if you have taken care of the basics. But um, again, education and so on. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's extremely important to be agile, adaptable. I mean, we are, you know, there are certain things. We, we are in a very interesting space, too, because on one hand, we have a, a, a lot of uh, development on the software side. Yeah. So, you know, that's classic software development, fine, but all of our software lives uh, 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 in the physical world, yeah? It has to basically drive systems that fly in, you know, airspace, yeah, in controlled airspace. So there is that, this level, you know, how to manage that risk is, is extremely complex and not a resolved issue at all, even on the regulatory level. So we are part of a lot of you know, consortia working on these things, new legislation. I mean, we had discussions, you know, on the, on the European level with civil aviation authorities in the, you know, mid noughts like 2004, 5, 6, even before the company started working as a company. Uh, uh, and those things are being resolved now, uh, in the last two years, yeah? So it takes, it takes time for regulation to kind of catch up sometimes with the needs that are coming from bottom up. So, uh, you know, on the other hand, would I like to see more digitization and robotics in the company? Yes, why not, you know, on the production level and so on. But then again, you have to calculate w the benefit. Yeah, we are a small company. Uh, our numbers are not gigantic, so, you know, and uh, we were able to survive all of these years on the market because we were the shop where people came to when they couldn't get the solution somewhere else. So we were able to customize. And when you customize, you cannot really digitize to depth, yeah? Because you don't have huge series and so on. It's not like automotive, you know, where, you know, you, you, you have a contract, you find a good solution, you negotiate to, yeah, you, you negotiate to death on the price, which, you know, it's going to be a very, very tight margin. Our margins are in the 30, 40, 50 percent, yeah, in the end on the product. So it's a, it's a very different world. But uh, adaptation and disability to kind of, if not adapt to regulation, but to customer requirements and special requests? Yeah, always. Was yeah. critical. I mean, that's, okay. that's the DNA of the company, mm -hmm. literally. Okay, thank you. Okay, to, f to finish off this discussion, uh, Mark, uh, just before you mentioned one interesting thing, which is that 
basically your digitization uh, story started with the company investing, meaning kind of creating their own hedge fund uh, or investment fund that was investing into these startups. Starting it in 2018 um, and having that experience, you've mentioned five products. Um, how long do you think projects like this need to be to kind of bring something to fruition? How much investment, how much time, how much patience does everybody need? Because obviously today everybody just wants to have results immediately or yesterday. It's a great question. So. Yeah, with us, it started in 2016, and then officially Collector Digital was opened in 2018. So in 2018, we started to make our first investments. Um, we chose different fields like robotics, AI, uh, VR, so virtual reality, uh, and so on. And I would say that the, the, the thing that we provided uh, besides financial um, support was also the testing playground. So we, we have 25 manufacturing companies. So immediately when you get the funds as a startup, you also have 25 companies that are willing to purchase and test your product. And the, the third part was actually a lot of domain knowledge. We have a lot of domain knowledge in, in different industries. We invest quite heavily into talent, uh, retaining talent, um, attracting talent. So I would say that with us, it took around two, two to three years uh, a lot of millions of euros uh, spent per different solution. And I I'm proud to say that after three years, so now in 2021, we have three really, really good solutions that we have implemented almost uh, across all 25 companies. And we've started selling these three solutions and offering it to uh, mainly Europe, so DAC region. Um, and yeah, so, so it took around three years, a lot of patience, a lot of teamwork, um, a lot of testing, and uh, especially when you have a big corporation like this, uh, it requires really a lot of buy-in, uh, not only from the, the different managers, different directors, um, but also from the uh, workers that are uh, working on the manufacturing line, because we are implement implementing robotics, so intelligent robotic worker who is in a way substituting a physical worker. Uh, we're implementing AI for planning manufacturing lines and that's the same uh, as also uh, we're taking away one, one of the planners, so a, a physical person. Uh, but the most important thing was also to get the buy-in from uh, all the manufacturing workers, so all, all 5,000 or, or a little bit less. Um, so we really did it gradually, step by step, implementing a small piece and we're trying to, to take the step uh, towards uh, machine plus human, so uh, the, they're kind of working together. They're not, machine is not replacing the human component, but it's helping uh, and, and making work easier. Okay, perfect, thank you. Well, this was uh, all that we had uh, as far as the time is concerned. Uh, thank you to all my panelists, I really appreciate you being here. Um, I hope this was very educational. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, this brings us slowly to the end of today's of, uh, business forum, Slovenian Polish business forum. Do we have some concrete takeaways? I mean, I think a lot from uh, these last two panel discussions in terms of different models of financing, different um, state, beyond of state of the art technologies. What would you say? Would you? Yeah, I, I think that we actually had uh, a lot of very interesting things that were being said. Uh, I would say that the most important ones is that all these uh, initiatives, digitiz digitization, uh, cybersecurity, are very important. The good part is that uh, Europe is recognizing them, so it's not just on the company level, which was seen at the end because we have successful company stories, but it's also that the regulators and the governmental entities are understanding that this is a key area that they need to focus on and actually kind of finance it and actually provide the environment where companies can succeed. So I think uh, this is a good way forward and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be um, even more important in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is all for today's Slovenian Polish Business Forum. I'm thanking all the panelists, all the speakers, all of you, participants, for your kind uh, uh, attention. 
Now we will take a short break and then the business to business meetings and networking between Polish and Slovenian companies will start. So if I understood correctly, the Polish delegation is staying for a few more days here in Slovenia. So I wish you all um, enjoy, to enjoy discovering Slovenia and all it has to offer. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have a great evening and, of course, stay healthy. Thank you.